OK, so we're going to look at a proof that every rational number has either a recurring or a terminating decimal expansion. And I find this proof particularly interesting because it gives some nice insight into the classic trick for converting from a recurring decimal into a fraction. So let's quickly look at this trick with this example where we've got 12.34 and the 5, 6 part is recurring. So the first thing we'll do is multiply this by 100 so that our non-recurring part is all an integer. So we get 1, 2, 3, 4, point 5, 6 recurring. Then if we multiply by 100 again, I'll write this as 10 to the 4 times x, or 10,000 x, then we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, point 5, 6 recurring. So we've got the 5, 6 recurring again. And now we're in a position to subtract 100 x from 10 to the 4 times x to get rid of our recurring part. So the recurring part will disappear and you get 10 to the 4, I'll write this as minus 10 squared x. This is now equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, minus 1, 2, 3, 4. So you get 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2 as our answer here with no recurring part. And then if we just divide on both sides now by 10 to the 4 minus 10 squared, you see that we've expressed our number x as a fraction with integer, numerator, and denominator. But what I find isn't particularly obvious is, let's say we take any fraction, 3 over 17, then why should we be able to express this in a form where the denominator is a difference of powers of 10? Because this is always going to be the case that with our recurring decimal expansion, you'll always be able to express this as a fraction where the denominator is a difference of powers of 10. So it's not obvious just looking at any fraction that we should be able to do this by multiplying our numerator and denominator by the same integer. So we'll also answer this question along the way in our proof. So now the idea for our proof is we'll start with a rational number which we'll call p over q. Then we want to somehow multiply p and q by the same integer so that we get a new denominator which is of the form some power of 10 minus another power of 10, which we'll just factorise and write like this. So then there's just a short argument after that to show why, if your denominator is of this form, then you've got a recurring decimal. So we're interested in the prime factorization of our original denominator, q, and in particular, the powers of 2 and 5. So we'll call this 2 to the alpha times 5 to the beta, and then all of the other prime factors we'll call p1 to the power of k1 up to pr to the power of kr. So these are all of our prime factors which aren't 2s and 5s. So then our 2s and 5s are going to give us this 10 to the m term. Then later we'll see how our other prime factors can give rise to this 10 to the n minus 1 term. So just looking at an example, let's imagine we had 2 to the power of 4 times 5 to the power of 7, you would just need to multiply this by 2 cubed to get, you would get 10 to the power of 7 then, so you'd get your power of 10. And in general, if we've got 2 to the alpha or 5 to the beta, it depends on which is bigger out of alpha and beta. So if beta is bigger than alpha, you might need to multiply by 2 to the power of beta minus alpha, or we might need to multiply by 5 to the power of alpha minus beta if alpha is bigger than beta. And if they're equal to each other, then we've actually already got a power of 10 there because it's 2 to the same power as 5 there. So we could already take this to be our 10 to the m term. So in either case, we need to multiply by one of these or leave it alone and multiply by 1. And we'll call this number capital A. So then once we've multiplied by this capital A, you've got A times Q is going to be 10 to some power, we'll call it 10 to the m, multiplied by all of the remaining prime factors. And you'll notice as well, in the case where alpha and beta are zero, so if there aren't any twos and there aren't any fives in the prime factorization of q, then we could actually just leave this as 10 to the power of zero. So you could take m as zero, and that would work for our purposes. So here we need to be a little bit careful about these remaining prime factor terms. So what if there aren't any prime factors that aren't twos or fives? So we'll consider this quickly just as a separate case, because if there aren't any remaining prime factors, then we can write our number p over q as a times p over a times q. But in this case where there aren't any remaining prime factors, we've now got a times p over a power of 10. So you can see now we've got an integer divided by a power of 10. 
So this is definitely going to give us not a recurring decimal, but actually a terminating decimal. So we can see where this case comes into play. This is where there aren't any prime factors that aren't twos or fives. So now we've got our denominator in the form 10 to the m multiplied by some prime factors, and we'll see how we can, just considering the case now where there are some extra prime factors that aren't twos and fives, we'll see how we can multiply this by something to get 10 to the n minus one. And this is where we're going to use Euler's theorem now. So we won't prove Euler's theorem, but we will take a moment to digest exactly what it's telling us and how this is going to be useful. So Euler's theorem tells us if you have two integers, which are co-primes, they don't have any common factors other than one, then a raised to a certain power is always going to be equivalent to one modulo b, modulo the other number. So you can think of this as being a multiple of b plus one. So what is this power that we're raising it to? Well, we don't actually care too much what the specific number is, but this is basically the number of integers less than or equal to b which are co-prime with b, but for our purposes we just want to have all of these prime factors expressed as a power of 10 minus 1. So we don't actually care what that power of 10 is. And here we're going to take a equal to 10, and you'll notice that 10, and by design all of these remaining prime factors, are going to be co-prime because we've taken out all of the 2s and 5s, so these are all of the prime factors which don't have 2s and 5s in them. So a equals 10, and we say b is p1 to the k1, all of these prime factors. You'll see that these are co-prime, which means we can apply Euler's theorem now. So we can then write 10 to the power of phi of b. This is equivalent to 1 modulo b. So then we can write this, because it's equivalent to 1 modulo b, we know that 10 to the power of phi b is actually equal to some multiple of b plus 1, so an integer multiple of b. So we'll call this capital B times lowercase b plus 1. So then if we subtract 1 on both sides, we get 10 to the 5 lowercase b minus 1 is now equal to some multiple of lowercase b. So let's remember what these lowercase b was actually representing. So this was b times all of these remaining prime factors, p1 to the k1, all the way up to pr to the kr. And then we can write this 10 to the phi of b minus 1. We don't actually care what this phi of b is. We can just write this now as 10 to the n minus 1. So having multiplied all of our remaining prime factors by this capital B, we've got it into the form 10 to the n minus 1. So then because a times q is of the form 10 to the m times all of our remaining prime factors, we just need to multiply by b now. So a times b times q is now going to be of the form 10 to the m, and then we replace multiplying by b. All of these prime factors multiplied by b just gives us 10 to the n minus 1. So now let's see why having the denominator in this particular format ensures we have a recurring decimal. So we've got our original rational number is p over q, then multiplying the numerator and denominator by ab, we get abp over abq. And we know that abq is 10 to the m times 10 to the n minus 1, and expanding the bracket, we get 10 to the m plus n minus 10 to the m as our denominator now. So then if we multiply by this denominator on both sides, we get 10 to the m plus n times x minus 10 to the m times x is equal to a times b times p. And this is particularly useful now because we've multiplied x by some different powers of 10 and subtracted, and we've ended up with an integer. So this means that when we do that subtraction, all of the decimal parts must cancel out with each other. So that will be really useful in finishing our proof. So here, just because we've multiplied a, b, and p, these are all integers, we've got an integer. So let's think about the decimal expansion of x. We'll say x is a1 up to ak before we reach the decimal point, and then we'll say we've got d1, d2, d3, and so on, following the decimal points. So this could go on forever, our decimal expansion. So then if we multiply this by 10 to the power of m, first of all, 10 to the mx 
we get still a1 up to ak, but this is all now 10 to the m times bigger, so our d1 up to dm are all now before the decimal point. So then after the decimal point we get dm plus 1, dm plus 2, and so on. And similarly, if we were to multiply x by 10 to the m plus n, we'd get the same sort of structure. Everything is now 10 to the m plus n times bigger. So we'd have a1 up to ak, then d1 up to dm plus n before we reach the decimal point. Then after the decimal point, we'd have dm plus n plus 1, then we would have dm plus n plus 2, and so on. So now using the fact that when we subtract 10 to the mx from 10 to the m plus nx, we get an integer, this tells us then that if we were to subtract the dm plus 1 term from dm plus n plus 1 term, these two would cancel out. So these two digits must actually be equal to each other. And similarly, our second digit must also cancel out, so these two must be equal to each other, and the same for dm plus 3 and dm plus n plus 3, and so on. So we can actually say then, because 10 to the m plus nx minus 10 to the mx is an integer, all of these pairs of decimals must cancel out with each other. So we can conclude, we'll write this a little bit more formally, as dm plus i is always equal to dm plus n plus i for all i greater than or equal to 1. So for example, dm plus 6 would be equal to dm plus n plus 6 because they would cancel out and give 0 when we do the subtraction. So let's think about what our decimal expansion of x actually looks like then. Because we've got this structure, we get the same pattern repeating every n times. So x we can write as a1 up to ak and the decimal point, then this bit d1 up to dm isn't necessarily part of the recurring structure. But then from here on out, let's write dm plus 1, then we've got dm plus 2, and so on, up to dm plus n. But then once we get to dm plus n plus 1, we get the same digit as we had for dm plus 1. If we go to dm plus n plus 2, we get the same digit as we had for dm plus 2 and so on. So actually we've proven then that we have this recurring structure, that this pattern will repeat every n digits. So then we've proven overall, in this case, that we're going to get a recurring decimal. And remembering that we had terminating decimals earlier in a separate case, we can conclude that every rational number then must have a recurring or a terminating decimal expansion.